Yay. Yahoo. All right. Hey, Peter. I'm still trying to get warm here. I see you, Julia Rose. I guess I should like take off all my. Let's see. Jam. It's a cool shirt, Amy. Where'd you get that from? Oh, really? Do you like my shirt, Peter Gorse? Yeah. Oh, we're, we have these on our site right now. This was the trial one. I was playing with it yesterday. It's a fundraiser t-shirt we're selling on the site right now. And this might be my new addiction using droppers, little droppers. Yeah. Yeah, and all the different dyes that, that come with the kit and just trying to make like but, mm. um, Toronto Ink Company like patterns. So are they all slightly different then? Are they all slightly different? They're the, all different. The, the, yeah, well. All unique, like this is something. Yeah. Okay, I tied my shirt, so. God, I'm glad you got <laughs> pants on. <laughs> There's probably gonna be different colors on my pants too, but. Yeah. Like we did this. Yeah, can you see Kathy? Hold yeah. On, so is the mordant mixed in with the dye then? Is it or no? The shirts are pre-mordanted. Oh, okay. 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 But yeah, like oh, how many of us? How many of us of us have mordanted t-shirts hanging around? Because I have a whole table full of dyes good. still. I have three more t-shirts on the clothesline. I thought it was Jackson Pollock. Just going. Yeah. Oh good. So much fun. So there's a dye garden that's going to be at the Chelsea Fashion Show. Did you know that? No. Done by Fashion Revolution. Yeah, they've done like a... Cool. Yeah. So they've done like a complete garden with, with natural dyes. Well, you should get everybody doing some exciting prints on T-shirts. Flower pounding. Flower Trappery. pounding. Bundle dyeing. All sorts of things. All exciting All right. things. How are we doing, Amy? Um, they're still coming in. All right. <laughs> Amy, Kathy, that's Kathy. a beautiful rug next to you. Oh. Do that functional art piece, you mean? Which one? I know this it's one? Leslie. That one. The, that's gorgeous. Yeah. It's from Porfirio Gutierrez's studio. Of course. Why would I not think that? Oh my God, it's so good. I almost had to wrestle her for it. We, and... we had kind of a fight. Okay, hold on a second. Speaking of Porfirio, it's Pam. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Pam. Pam. I am so sorry that I haven't written to you, Amy, since we came back from the workshop, but I was down taking care of my three-year-old grandson and just didn't have time. But I want to tell everybody that was the most amazing workshop I have right, experience I have ever had. It was fabulous. And after the first day, I said, if we never even die anything, this has been fabulous it just he is such an amazing person uh, yeah oh my gosh. that was that was a great class and I, I loved how it had you know the medicinal dye part to it but then the the history of dyes his mom and dad coming up from Oaxaca it was the just cere it, blessing ceremony oh my just like, every minute of it was yeah. incredible yeah, so was, um I highly recommend that you uh, get him to do it again <laughs> because there are well, a lot of people out there that would love it. I know. And we're going to be in, um, in Seattle. Porfirio is going to be there. Abu Bakr Fofana. I'll be there. Kathy will be there. There's a, uh, I forgot which week it is, Kathy. There's like a whole month the of mineral mud workshop week. Yeah. So we're holding a mineral mud workshop. Um, on the 25th, 26th, and 27th. And Porfirio and Abu Bakr are good friends. So he's coming up to take the workshop. And we have a bunch of other really cool people. Do you guys, you know, you guys know Kenya Miles from Blue Light Junction. She's planning on being there as well. So it's going to be a, a really fun, fun time. Ara Marie Piazza, I think, is going to be there too. She's planning. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be exciting. Okay, listen. Yeah, we have 140, 
141 people here now. All and right, so Amy, are down. you ready to count us in? I get nervous to do this every week, and this is like episode 96. One day we'll be ready. Okay. We'll have 95, it says. One day my heart will stop beating so fast. All right, everybody mute yourselves if you haven't already. And here we go. Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday, so come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday, we're on the loose. We'll be the train, you be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. Oh my goodness, here we are again. <laughs> Welcome everybody. It is Feedback Friday and Amy, you said episode 96, but your run of show says episode 95. Then you're correct. Okay, we are at episode 95 of Botanical Colors Feedback Friday. My name's Kathy Hot Tori. I'm the president of Botanical Colors and joining me from Cape Cod is Amy Dufo, Director of Sustainability and Communications. And today we are going to journey into a place I've never been before. But before we do that, let me just tell you a little bit about Feedback Friday. It's our weekly show where we meet with artists, scientists, scholars, dyers, historians, activists, growers, uh, let's see, who am I else? Writers and anybody else who is interested in our favorite topic, which is natural dyes and color. Um, joining us is, we're really, really, really excited to welcome artist, writer, educator, and founding director of the Nomad MFA, Carol Padberg, who is Zooming in from Hartford, Connecticut. Carol has an art and ecology studio where she weaves with living oyster mushrooms using yarn that is colored by plants from her backyard dye garden. She uses regenerative agricultural strategies to maintain a city micro farm with a micro automobile as well called Nook Farmhouse. Carol's presentation is going to take you to, into the world of interspecies art in which a flock of sheep, a dye garden, soil organisms, oyster mushrooms, and a human being weave their life stories together. Before we start, I just wanna say thank you everyone. Thank you for supporting us. Uh, and supporting Feedback Friday and all of our programming. Uh, we could not do this without your incredible support and the enthusiasm and uh, just having that experience at Porfirio's last month where we met people that had been um, remote and virtual. It was pretty emotional. It was amazing to be able to see and meet people. It was like we knew each other, but we'd actually never met in person. It was pretty interesting. So we're planning to do another one of um, those in real life things this summer. So we hope you can join us there. Uh, Amy's gonna be moderating the chat and uh, for the presentation, we have everyone muted and chat turned off. However, um, she'll open up chat at the uh, end of Carol's presentation where you can tap, type in your questions and we will ask Carol all of these penetrating inquiries into like, how exactly are you doing this? Um, after we're, we're done with the presentation and some announcements, we'll open it up where everyone can, everyone can say hello and goodbye. So without any further ado, I would love to dearly, dearly welcome Carol Padberg. Thank you, Carol, take it away. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get started here. All right, and I'm gonna move this so I can see. 
All right. Well, thank you. I want to uh, begin by thanking Amy and Kathy and Botanical Colors and all of you who have joined us today. Um, it's a really big pleasure and honor to be here. I live and work in the Connecticut River Valley, and this is unceded land and water that I live along and in. Many people have called this place home and still do, including the Podunk, Tunxis, Wangunk, and Seagog peoples, and many other Native communities. I want to honor the continuing teachings of uh, Native people on this continent and their resilience. May respect for the land, waters, and original people of this place be ever present. May land justice strengthen year by year. And this talk is dedicated to the family of life on our planet Earth. And my slide is not advancing. Carol, use the, um, the virtual arrows at the bottom of your lower bottom, left bottom. OK. Those seem to work better. Are those working? They are not. How unusual. Hmm. There we go. All right. It may be a little slow, but that works. Sometimes I'm a little slow too. So welcome to my garden. Uh, this is the place that my art practice began. In fact, uh, 10 years ago, I was asked by my family, what would you like for Mother's Day? And I said, let's get a truck full of earth and let's that's it in our backyard and make a garden. And so my family, this isn't advancing. I wonder if I should. Um, hey, Carol, can you use the, the um, arrows on your keyboard? Is that that's what you're what I'm using? using? Yeah. Then, then instead, move your mouse over to the bottom okay. left of the screen and you'll see like the little front and back arrows that'll, that'll those, come up. Those, they're ah. kind of ghosty. I go like down, those. go to the lower left. Yeah, you're oh, close. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now we're, talking. Use those. now we're talking. Now we're talking. Thank you. Pro tip. Oh, learned so much from you guys. So here's the garden 10 years ago when uh, my kids and my husband, Paul, asked me, what do you want to do on Mother's Day? And I said, let's get some of that good leaf compost from the town uh, leaf composting site. And you can see the dump truck just about to release all that good dirt. And you can see my kids who were around uh, 10, 13, and 16 at the time. We started a garden. And although I had been a general gardening interested person for a while, um, this was really the beginning of a bunch of community art that you can see on my website that's agriculturally related, as well as the art practice I'll talk about today. Lots has changed since then, and in fact, the lot has changed since then. My family and I now live here in Hartford, and this was our current backyard after it was planted about seven years ago. This is what it looks like now that it is established. And uh, this is a space that we depaved to reach our earth and regenerate the soil outside our back door. Um, it's important to realize that this is an urban place. This is an aerial view of my part of Hartford in Asylum Hill. And down below with that star, you can see my lot, which is 50 feet wide and 150 feet deep. And most of that is a house. <laughs> but I think this is really important to point out because as we're learning about the actions we can take to sequester carbon, to grow our own food, to be more connected with the web of life that we are a part of, how we use urban and suburban spaces is hugely important. So I'm going to talk with you today about my uh, interspecies art practice. Here's my son modeling a wearable mycelial sculpture. I make these woven sculptures with oyster mushrooms. And they're uh, meant to be used individually, but also in group workshops that help humans develop new neural pathways 
new neural pathways that help us relate differently to the multi-species nature of our own bodies, as well as our place in the web of life. These are sculptures that are made to dissolve. And so I put these sculptures back in my dye garden and they release nutrients that help the plants. And so then the mushrooms are feeding the future colors of next year's garden. They also feed a host of um, organisms and uh, it's always nice to go out and see how things are decomposing, see who's munching on them. They spawn more mushrooms at times. And then on the left here, this is a picture I took yesterday from my front porch. They provide great material for nesting birds. And I was delighted to see some of the fibers from my sculpture in a bird's nest in the light fixture on my front porch. So today I'll get into the how and why of weaving with mycelia. If you look at it really closely, you can see here there's a detail of a weaving with some mycelial matting and pinning going on. But before that, I want to introduce you to the partners in this interspecies art practice. Meet my chickens. They aerate the soil. They help fertilize the garden with their droppings. And they really bring the party. I could spend so much time just watching my chickens. They're really entertaining. Um, we eat their eggs and that helps us uh, be aware of the cycle of nutrients that we're a part of. I also want to introduce you to some plant beings. These plants feed us. We grow fruit trees in this intensely planted backyard. We have vegetables, we have some plants that provide medicine, especially comfrey and calendula and St. John's wort, and lots of dye plants. And all of these plants are kind of mixed in together um, at different heights and different parts of the season. Uh, certain plants are showstoppers at other times, they're just quietly growing. But in the summer, this is a common sight in my studio on the left that I have these uh, racks of drying plants. My husband and I keep bees. This is Paul, and these are some of our bees. And um, if you ever want an education in ecology and a sense of urgency in terms of pollinator protection and the work that's needed these days to keep hives going year to year, raise bees. Um, we have learned so much from our bees and we have savored every drop of their honey. Um, I wanna introduce you to oyster mushrooms. Uh, these are mushrooms that are really charismatic. They are uh, friendly. They, they make people want to touch them and smell them and pet them and admire them. They're also really good mycoremediators. So they help dissolve a lot of harmful um, elements in our environment. And they have taught me so much over the last few years. There's now a run of oyster mushrooms throughout my part of Hartford. <laughs> because as these um, beings have uh, entered the soil through uh, this practice, um, they've been getting around. And so this is a, a sprouting of oyster mushrooms that happened in a different part of my yard and alerted me to how they're getting around. Um, oyster mushrooms can naturally grow in this environment, but I had never seen them before in this part of Hartford. Our newest uh, collaborators in this interspecies art practice are my Lester Longwell sheep. And um, I've been so delighted and honored to raise sheep with my friend Rob recently. We just got a spinner's flock last summer and they are at Rob's place in Putnam, Connecticut. To see these sheep through the different seasons of the year, to think about uh, getting a ram and then get a ram and, and breed them to help them as they deliver babies. We just delivered, uh, we attended a birth of uh, the you delivering a baby. Let's get that straight. She did all the work um, this past Monday. So um, to question and contemplate and be involved in the mutual 
care and support uh, between sheep and humans, which has been going on for thousands of years, has also been an amazing teacher for me. There are some questions that go along with my art practice. And um, I want to just, whoops, go over them. I've got to move the pictures of everybody to see that. Um, there are so many questions, but I decided on three of them for today. One is, what happens when an artist trades in the idea of art materials for the practice of relationships with living beings that they work with in art making? Another one is, how can interspecies art help undo human hyper-individualism by reminding us that we are holobionts? And holobionts are beings made up of many beings, like humans, like cows. Uh, you think of a cow and you think it's digesting grass. No, it's not digesting grass. It's a community of microbes in its complex stomach is really doing the digesting. And for humans, more uh, non-human DNA makes us up than human DNA. So this idea of the holobiont is one that I think helps us remember our place in the web of life. Finally, how can we learn from mushrooms to compo compost what's no longer useful? Can these sculptures be a ceremony for release? How can I make this experience more available to people? Well, I'm going to let you in on something that uh, those who are here today will be the first to hear of, and that is that um, I'm launching a way that I can send you some of these mycelial sculptures and you can experience this firsthand and do some of this composting work that you'll learn more about. Another question you might have is, how on earth did Carol start working with mycelia as a weaver? Um, I did a project in 2018 where I was commissioned to make an ephemeral public artwork. And this was at iPark and their biennial of environmental art. I uh, made a 1000 square foot bio quilt. Uh, it was made of fabric uh, that I quilted uh, with sheet mulch underneath. And this was to bring soil health back to a sandy area that had been extracted from. Um, and what, what happened was really surprising to me. First off, there came to be a little microclimate under the cloth where insects and plants were growing. But I also became very interested in how the decomposition process and all of that life force in the soil that was developing shaped the te textiles. And so as I would check the piece, I became really interested in the molds and the mildews. And then one day I checked the piece and it blew my mind. <laughs> I saw these mycelial strands weaving into the cloth as they wanted to digest it. And this really shifted my whole world um, because I thought, oh my gosh, as I looked at it under a magnifying glass, I want to play. I want to play with you, mycelia, and I want to learn about this process. Um, so before too long, I bought a used Sayori loom. This is a Japanese loom from um, a tradition of therapeutic weaving that uh, comes from uh, a viewpoint that weaving should be open to all and should be easily accessible. And so this was a perfect loom for me to start with because I could learn how to warp it very easily. I could play around with it as I learned how to do a basic uh, broadcloth weave. So I took the um, dye plants and I dyed up a bunch of colors and I started weaving and this was my first cloth. And I set it down in my backyard on some gravel near my studio. And I thought, oh, do you think do you think maybe I can get the, the mycelia to weave with me? And so I got some mycelial substrate um, from Mycoterra Farm Cooperative in Western Mass. 
And I, I started playing around. And sure enough, the mycelia said, yes, we want to play. So I was astounded when the um, hypha started showing up as this fuzz. And then we had some primordia. And then we had some pinning baby mushrooms. And I, I was just delighted to see how they were coming through the textile. And I had uh, put in there different colors. And so we had some uh, pink oyster mushrooms and white oyster mushrooms and yellow oyster mushrooms. And I started seeing how this was going to shape my practice for years to come. I made an initial sculpture where I um, exhibited in a gallery a sculpture that uh, had this first textile with some uh, back backyard mushroom logs. And I let it go through that cycle of um, reproduction. And it was the only time I've done this in a gallery. I don't do it in a gallery anymore for various reasons. Um, but I, I was astounded at how much change uh, was happening and how interested people were in this process. I had a mister so people could take care of the sculpture. And um, it really got me thinking about mushrooms more deeply. Um, so let's think about mushrooms for a minute. They are indeterminate in form. You know, you think of a human, uh, humans usually end up looking the same way. Mushrooms can uh, turn out very differently depending on their setting and their needs and what they're doing. Um, they don't have senescence. This is your new word of the day. Senescence is uh, a biologically determined lifespan. So there are some fungal bodies that have been going on for hundreds or thousands of years. They grow laterally, which is really interesting because I've always been um, a thinker who thinks laterally and I'm interested in non-convergent solutions and ways of working. Uh, they blur life and death, creation and destruction. They are perched right at that place, especially uh, the sort of mushrooms I use of being the being that takes nutrients of something that has just died and frees up those nutrients into a form that new life can use. Um, so in this way, they're life's verbs, they're the planet's verbs, they're doing the actions of our planet's metabolism. I also like to remember how they have the wisdom of jumping out of the water, being the first being that left the soupy waters of life that was forming on this planet in ecological time. It was fungi who um, left that water and started living on earth. So they are important ancestors for us that have very old earth wisdom. They also build soil, they're mysterious, we're just starting to learn about them. And they trouble the idea of the individual because they're in us, they're around us. Um, they really are good teachers for thinking about the hollow biont nature of our own bodies. And as though that's not enough, they also bioremediate things like crude oil, glyphosate, plastics, TNT, even radioactivity, which is pretty amazing. Um, we breathe them, we host them, we depend on them for sure. And they're incredibly durable. So spores, living spores of mushrooms have been found above the human atmosphere in outer space. What's not to love? I was uh, captivated. And so one of the next things I wanted to do was to see if I could find out ways that as an artist, I could make forms that would allow my excitement about this being and how I could weave with it to be accessible to other people in a really direct way. So I started making things like this, an arm sleeve uh, with mushrooms growing through it. And I started playing around with masks, both whole face masks and also masks that would just go over your eyes. Um, I started creating workshops that people could come play with me. And I developed a way of um, having prompts with each of these mycelial forms so that in the instance of the person on the right, um, it was about sight and um, trying to see with your whole body. 
And uh, really, what would it mean if you could feel the pulse of mushrooms through your eyelids and help that, have that help you see differently? And so it was a really playful way of encountering mushrooms on the left. The um, uh, ecological educator, Lauren Little, is encountering uh, the mushroom through her skin fungal community. And can we sense when our fungal communities relate to the mycelia of oyster mushrooms? There are, were so many ways of introducing uh, these forms to people and it became uh, a captivating uh, choreography to figure out, you know, how do I introduce people to this? And even in the stage where it's just like on the right, a fungal mat at the very beginning of the life stage, people were interested in encountering all the different stages of life of the fruit of mycelia. I developed games. Uh, so these people are using their hands and one person is pointing to a mushroom on the other person's sleeve. And then that person is imitating the shape of the mushroom with their hand. This is a game where two people hold hands under the mushroom um, tunnel and squeeze each other's hand to mimic the pulses of water that mushrooms use um, as they grow. And I found that children in particular were such good teachers in terms of how we could engage with mushrooms and their sense of curiosity and their questions became part of this process as well. Uh, what happens when you put a mushroom sculpture over your heart and you think about what you want to transform in yourself and you ask mushrooms to help you with that transformation? There are so many ways to relate to these mushroom sculptures. So I started gathering uh, feedback from people who had been through these experiences. And once they had had some time to integrate the experience, they would write to me and give me uh, some of their thoughts. And I took these thoughts into a writing that was recently published in this book called Multi-Species Storytelling and Intermedial Practices. That title is a handful, but the good news is you can get a free copy of this book uh, by PDF. And here is the link to do that. Um, I, I really had fun with this writing because it allowed me to tie together what I had been doing as an artist with the theoretical angles, um, whether that's Robin um, Kimmerman's work or uh, Deleuze and his idea of um, lateral thinking. Um, there are ways that what I was doing connected with ancient practices of uh, cosmology, and I tied it all together with storytelling in that book. Um, and the more I thought about these ancestral ways that um, people have been using weaving as a way of telling stories about world making, and the way as an artist I was doing an additive process of weaving, and then the mycelia was undoing it, by decomposing it and you know they weave to eat. I was just getting more and more deeply involved in this world of weaving with mushrooms and the meaning of that. And that brought me to Marshfield School of Weaving last fall where I had an experience I wanna to recommend to those of you who like to learn about weaving and dyeing, <clears throat> pardon me. They have a class called Fleece to Fulling, and you stay there for about a month and you are handed a raw fleece and you learn how to wash it, you learn how to spin with it, and you learn how to weave it. And these things are done using ancestral processes from um, a New England and European um, set of ancestral processes. Of course, around the world, there are ancestral processes of weaving and almost in every case, that weaving process goes back to mythological world-making stories. Um, but because of who I am and who the people are that I came from, it was really beneficial to think about um, in pre-Christian Europe how um, these old stories of weaving as world be 
world um, writing <clears throat> were um, created and um, told through these stories. <clears throat> so then I rehabilitated a um, walking wheel. My friend Edie, who alerted me to the fact that there was a um, Facebook ad for a forlorn looking walking wheel is on this call. Thank you, Edie. Um, and so I started a uh, practice of uh, spinning and carrying around with me a drop spindle, as well as when, when I'm at home using the walking wheel, processing fleet, fleece from the Lester Longwool sheep, and then also learning how to weave on a barn loom, which is a lot more complex and sophisticated um, than my uh, initial efforts at weaving. And so on the right is a shawl that I made. Um, and I'm, I'm a slow but steady learner of weaving processes. And it's just been such a gift to go deeper into those traditions. At the same time, I was tuning in more and more to the fact that the oyster mushrooms I use are from the family of mushrooms that is an expert community in death and regeneration. And it reminded me of things that we talk about in um, the MFA program that I direct, which include this idea that if we're really to understand regeneration, we need to become familiar with that moment in the life cycle of death to life. And um, my friend Linda Weintraub has taught a whole class on this in the MFA program. And I realized how much that was really key to what I'm doing as an artist. And watching these sculptures dissolve in my backyard, um, really making friends with the fact that we all will decompose, my body will decompose and become part of that nutrient flow. Everything around us is part of that cycle of life has really been transformative for me. Um, it also connected me with the work of the Decolonial Futures Group, uh, which is a collective of um, thinkers who are putting out into the world really great materials on how the problems that we're facing as a planet, whether that's mass extinctions or climate chaos or flooding or wildfires, all of it has to do with a set of problems that humans developed, including uh, settler colonialism and white supremacy and hyper-capitalism. And so they have a lot of ways of talking about this, but one of the ways that I find really helpful is to talk about the metabolic responsibilities we have as humans on the planet right now. And this card from their card deck on the right that says, how can we hospice a dying way of knowing being and assist with the birth of something new, still fragile, undefined, and potentially but not necessarily wiser is a question I think about a lot. So now um, I am considering how, just like a mushroom sends out its spores into the world, how can these sculptures uh, go out into the world and help people transmute uh, what needs to be transmuted? In my process, this working with the mushrooms has allowed me to have a physical way of laying to rest and metabolizing things that I've been working on, whether it's the anti-racism work that I do or thinking how can I extract myself from um, this really densely capitalist world I live in and try to be more regenerative, try to be less um, extractive. And um, I think having a physical way of working with something that does decompose is really helpful with that. So today I'm launching a set of 30 of these mycelial sleeves that you can buy or sign up for on a sliding scale through my website, the uh, URL is down there below and uh, Amy's gonna pop it into the chat. And what this kit will include is one of the sleeves with a handmade journal that will have some prompts in it for your thinking about this. 
and also uh, a community of the 30 people, including myself, who will um, come together through at least three Zoom meetings throughout a year and talk about what they're doing and what their experience of this has been like. So if you want to try this out, um, go to the website and, and take a look at it. Um, I think that the most important thing for me with all of this is that we continue to find ways to use art to uh, foster conversations around personal and collective change and to do it in ways that incite a sense of wonder. Um, so with the uh, oyster mushrooms, I think for me personally, it's been that case of having this sense of awe and having that awe provoke questions and then following those questions along in a way that <clears throat> for me has really enriched my life and, and shaped me into a somewhat different person than I was 10 years ago when that first load of dirt arrived in my backyard. So to conclude, what happens when an artist trades in art materials for relationships with beings? I found that it's just, exponentially increased my sense of the power of art and my connection with the, the planet we live on. Um, I'd encourage any of you, and I know you all are, there are many people who are already fully doing this in their work who are part of this Zoom conversation today. But for those of you who might not have thought about art materials as relationship, I want to encourage you to just make a small step or two to do that. And certainly working with your natural dyes is a relationship. So this is a perfect uh, group to talk about this with. How can interspecies art help undo human hyper-individualism by reminding us that we are holobionts? I think there are so many ways that we can do this, um, but certainly these mushrooms, mm, they've got just working with the body of the mushroom and seeing the process it goes through. There's a lot of that that I think physically we respond to because we have fungi living in us and on us, and it's just part of what we are. Um, how can we learn from mushrooms to compost what is no longer useful? Can these sculptures be a ritual for release? That's a question I hand to you. And if you're interested in um, working with this on me, I think it will be a really rich conversation. So with that, I wanna wrap up my presentation and shift into any questions you might have. Carol, that was just incredible. Thank you so much. It really, it was such a beautiful way of, of linking like the mycelial world that is everywhere. It's under our feet, but we really have no visibility to us as, um, you know, it's just a regular person hanging out. You know, you don't really think about what's under your feet other than like the asphalt or the concrete. So being able to just give us a peek into that world was uh, fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Amy. Um, thank you so much for that amazing, amazing presentation. And Amy, uh, take it away. I know there's tons of questions yeah. um, for Carol. <laughs> there were no questions for a minute. I was like, is everybody just processing this, thinking about mushrooms and, you know, just contemplating what was just said? but. I'm sure that's happening, but now here come the questions. But, and just so you know, there's somebody that's trying to buy your book right now and they're having some problems with it, with mm. purchasing. So we'll have to- Reach out maybe. to me. I, I might be able to help. I think that's probably through Punctum Books. So I can also connect with them. You're, you're, it's actually the kit on your site. Ah. There's something that's this, happening. Okay. So, okay. There's a inquiry button. And if you're having trouble with the order, reach out to me through that inquiry button. And that way I'll know how to reach you and we can sort it out. This is new. It's just being launched today. So yeah, be patient. We'll get it worked out. All right. Okay, here we go. Hi, Carol. I know that you have worked in Mexico and New Mexico, which are very dry, hot and cold 
climates. Does this process work in places other than the North or Northeast alternative species for these climates? Yeah, I was just talking um, with my friend Chrissy Orr recently about the mushrooms in New Mexico, and I was delighted to, to learn that oyster mushrooms do grow there. Um, there are also active mushroom uh, enthusiast communities in Mexico. Think of uh, Maria Sabina, who has been so, who was so instrumental in um, helping people understand some of the medicinal qualities and mystical qualities of ingesting magical mushrooms. Um, so there is a, a mushroom community everywhere. And um, you might not always think of it in these more arid climates, but um, mushrooms are so integral in life on our planet that, you know, we're finding fungal communities in surprising places um, all over the place. And so I'm not a mycologist and I can't really say more than that in terms of the specifics of mushrooms in different places, but all of those examples of Mexico, New Mexico, the Southwest, um, they're, they're places where there's a rich, uh, rich mycological community. And uh, that's a really good question. I appreciate it. Um, have you made any dyes with your mushrooms? I've made inks. My intern, uh, Zazu Elizabeth, um, she made a beautiful ink with honey mushrooms last summer. And I, I make a series of drawings. Um, I didn't show them today because time is kind of tight, but um, I've been drawing with mushroom ink and there's so many amazing dyes that you can make with mushrooms. And I know Botanical Colors has a lot of them. So I haven't done much with that, um, but it's there and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes into my practice sometime soon in the textile way. Mm. Can you talk briefly about the Nomad MFA program? Oh, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, this is a program that is dedicated to regenerative art practices. And so while that may include galleries and the, the art world, it also includes ways that artists can access a toolkit that can help with art and healing, art and regeneration, um, art addressing the many complex issues that our planet faces right now. Artists learning more sophisticated ways of dealing with community and the ethics of community engagement. And all of this happens through a field-based curriculum where we go to sites in the Americas and we collaborate with artists there wherever we have our residency. We meet twice a year, which allows people from all over the world to be part of this MFA program. And um, it's been one of the gifts of my life to bring that program into being and facilitate it. Okay, look at me doing crazy things with the chat and not, okay, here, I'm back. Will you explain the process of inoculating the fabric? Kathy and I found this pretty interesting when we talked with you on Tuesday. Yes, please. Absolutely. So um, what I do is I uh, make these sculptures with a layer that I can fill. And I take a pre-inoculated um, mushroom substrate oyster mushroom substrate. And I, I think many of you may have seen kits for growing your own mushrooms. And often that substrate is uh, in a bag that you buy and then you take care of it and it pops the mushrooms out. This is often um, wood chips or wood shavings. Um, sometimes it is coffee grounds, that's the substrate. Sometimes it is grain, sometimes it's a combination of things. You can um, capture, you can clone your mushrooms and then inoculate your own textiles. Uh, that's something that I've been experimenting with. 
Um, but often when I'm making this, I want to support local businesses and I work with Myco Terra Farm, a collective of mushroom farmers in Western Massachusetts and um, get the substrate ready to go um, because also sometimes there's, there's a time frame for me because I'm intensely um, dyeing and weaving. And then when the time is right, I wanna stuff these with the mycelial substrate. And then it's a matter of taking care of them and um, providing optimal amounts of air and humidity and water and temperature, um, controlling the temperature a little bit and uh, doing this in a way that is healthy for the mushroom and also healthy for uh, the environment that I live in. And so, um, yeah, a really good book that um, outlines this is um, DIY Mushroom Projects. Um, I can uh, send you a, a, a link on that. There's a lot of materials on how this can be done, but I encourage you to experiment with it because it's, it's a really satisfying way to grow your own mushrooms and understand more about mycelia along the way. Okay. Carol, I'm gonna make sure I put your email in the, um, in the chat because a couple people, somebody else is mentioning that they're having some challenges with the first time launch of this kit. So we'll Thank just- Thank you for your patience. So yeah, you yeah, can but we'll, reach we'll, me. I'll get yeah. it, I'll pop it in there as you're talking, yeah. as, as you're answering the next question, I'm gonna get it off your website, but- I'm, I'm yeah. just gonna say it. It's carolpadberg okay. at gmail.com. So carolpadberg at gmail.com. And um, yeah, be in touch and thank you for your patience as we get this system up and running. Okay. So, and I put some, um, Deborah's asking, do you have resources for your regenerative agricultural practices? I wanna do that in my backyard, but I, I did just put that Mycoterra farm in the chat too. But what, are, maybe some other resources that you have that you're yeah. using in your backyard. So, uh, so many things pop to mind. One is um, the native seed banks that are popping up all over the country as a way to, um, have a forward reaching branch of something that's been going on since time immemorial, which is um, that heirloom seeds have been saved and cultivated by indigenous communities. So that's a good place to start. Another place that you can start is learning about indigenous practices through something called uh, permaculture, which is a, a complex, um, sometimes complicated hybrid of um, ways of learning how to garden that are more systems based. And um, most of what you learn in a permaculture design training uh, comes from indigenous knowledge systems. And so if you look up permaculture trainings in your area, that's a really good way to learn. You can also go woofing, which is work on an organic farm. And many farms do a trade where you could take a few weeks or a month or a season and live there and really understand what's involved with composting, growing crops in a way that su supports the soil and learning all of those really hands-on practices that are involved in uh, regenerative agriculture. And then there's more theoretical ways to go about it, which is uh, learning about systems theory and um, just different ways of thinking about systems as a design approach. Um, but I think some of the hands-on ways of going about it are the best to start. And then if they lead you to the more theoretical, that's fine. Um, but I'd rather see people learn by doing than read about it because there's such a need for regenerative practices. And I think the more we do it, the more exciting it is as well. Okay, well, I'm just gonna finish this off with somebody's, uh, Deanna Wilkes Gibbs, who's such a nice person who always comes to these Feedback Fridays, um, a comment which she was saying, great talk, super thought provoking, like what is art anyway? Or even how does work become art? Thanks for inspiring, inspiring me to consider these ideas more deeply. So, um, and you're in the chat, there's lots of people who 
you obviously brought a fan club with you because they're all excited for you to bring this all back to um, Nat uh, Natalie stop because saying thanks and bringing it bringing it back to the nomad MFA program and others are saying things. yeah Beautiful. all right well, I have to thank you all for being here today it's I was uh, telling Kathy and Amy, I went through about seven versions of this talk. It became like a review of the last 10 years of my life. <laughs> and uh, It's been a real pleasure to share with you today. And I feel very grateful. So it's been definitely a reciprocal exchange. Well, thank you, well, Carol. We are nourished for another week. That's amazing. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I mean, I can't even begin to look down anymore without going, oh my God, what's underneath there? Um, thank you, Carol. Super fantastic. Uh, Amy's got Carol's contact info if you're interested in that uh, incredible kit. And uh, yeah, so just email her and I'm sure you can be put in the queue for it. Um, but let me just tell you a few announcements and then we will unmute to say uh, hello and goodbye. Um, just want to know that we have uh, free domestic shipping. We've, we're trying to figure out how to um, like deal with the, uh, the inflation bug that's sort of been going everywhere. And so we decided that, you know what, we can do free shipping. And so we're going to do that. That is probably going to go through the end of May. So uh, if you want to stock up for the summer, it's a great time to do it because you get free domestic U.S online shipping. Um, workshops, we've been um, talking about the workshops for a few sessions now, and uh, we have both um, the Cape Cod forage experience that's including like seaweed and uh, ink making and anything that Amy can like figure out we could do <laughs> in, a, in an afternoon workshop we are gonna do. And so that is uh, at the end of June. June 27th and 28th, sorry, mm -hmm. 27th, 28th um, at Coonmasset Farm in um, Falmouth. Falmouth. Yeah, good job. Try and Falmouth, here. Massachusetts. Falmouth, Massachusetts. So it's a beautiful <laughs> place and we're going to have a great time. We also have um, in real life workshops in Seattle here starting in July and going through the beginning of August. And many of you uh, know there's just this lineup of incredible learning experiences as well as events that will be open to the public. Um, so if you can't make it for a workshop, we've got other things going on, including a gallery reception, um, a farm talk, a, a community indigo dip, potential West African food thing going on. I mean, it's happening. So try to try to make it. It'll be a lot of fun with Abu Bakar Fofana. And the last thing that we have to like talk about is of course, Amy, show them the shirt. Oh, what? This old thing? That's right. <laughs> um, Wait a we're minute. doing a fundraising with Jason Logan um, and the Toronto Inc. Company in order to raise funds for um, the refugee situation that's happening in Ukraine, as well as to um, partially fund our scholarship program. So already we've been able to fund like 15 scholarships out of this for our um, summer workshop. So it's working, you guys. Thank you so much. It's, it's been really super helpful. So that is wonderful. Not and, to mention it's a blast. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to do them. Um, yeah, and then next fun. week on Feedback Friday, we will have a Swedish-based Lata Rama talking about natural dyeing and fish leather. And I just <laughs> looked her up and she's got like a master class on YouTube in fish leather dyeing, which, you know, we've got a lot of salmon out here in the Pacific Northwest. So some, one, one day somebody brought a bunch of salmon skins to me to dye. And it is really interesting. It does take the dye, um, but man, the smell was a little bit interesting. So you're not gonna you're not gonna like leave botanical colors and become a fish leather natural well, dye. You know, I thought, hey, this could be like a totally new take on the Harley Davidson crowd. <laughs> is like this, you know, sustainable fish naturally dyed fish leather um, garments. But no, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my God. Anyway, let us go ahead and unmute. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you, Carol Padberg, for that amazing. Thank you, Thank you Carol. And uh, we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Bye. 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 Thank you everybody. Thank you, Carol. Hey, Thank Uncle, you. how are you? I know. I've been Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Lovely. This was amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Hi, Diane. Hi, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. Wow. So many people. Yeah, there's Ricky, too. Edith has all kinds of metal chairs around her. I'm fearing for her life. <laughs> she's that's gonna have friends. With an, oh, mate, maybe she's at a cafe. A cafe of metal chairs. I think she might be in Paris. Maybe oh, she's gonna have friends. Edith. Oh yeah, no, that is um, that's my fake backdrop, but it's the uh, chairs on the University of Wisconsin Memorial Union patio. Oh wow. Oh. Where in Wisconsin is the University of Wisconsin Memorial Union patio? It's in it's in <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin, and if you ever go there, it's a fabulous place. The student union serves beer like an old German rat sculler, and then the patio looks out on Lake Mendota, and they have sailing and ice sailing and all kinds of things. Oh, it's wow. a oh, nice place. I am going to Madison, Wisconsin in two weeks. Oh my God. Oh, you have to check it out. That's the right. best time of year is June or May. Yeah. All right. I will do that. And this is the Edie who hooked me up with my walking wheel. Of oh. course. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the yeah. Carol, Carol Padberg fan club. <laughs> I like there was somebody like, can you tell us more about the Nomad MFA program? Like, right. <laughs> that, was, that was cued and ready. <laughs> but we all fell for it, right? Yeah, we did. <laughs> all right. I'm going to stop good. the recording. Okay. Okay. Thank you.